Wow. Fire. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. Wow. I'm going to make it. 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 I'm in a malign connect, why just in case? Come, Nico Gaida, here, Anka, just in case, Lord Hell, hang in, ping in the new, ping in the new, skin care plus, see Barrek in your donut, a bar barrek, funnily your dem to room, the link indirect products you bar. Do Paris, do Italy, do USA, ah, do the mechanism, ball and link in Sweden, funnily in the products, put it in the new rig, new lay jama, ah, natural beauty, that melanin dripping, we do have stuff for you as well. And when you skin care products like you can chew vitamin, ah, funny than you are. In fact, sir, last commercial being the phone, what will you want to know? Dr. Aikawar, nine A grade, right? Now, wow, we do have bundles as well. Hair, so don't know, you know, you can have a little jigging, right? Little jigging, right? Wow, what on the two kitchen it? Book on that classic suitcase, you know, Dr. A Samsonite. Bring they into any brown of suitcases though other than Samsonite. Come lima day warak. Bo ege airport. Diri Samsonite. Def am nun la hole. Wow. Ngen de la nak. Wow. Um skin. Chimom le nyugena hame nak skin care products. Chimom le nyugena hame. Nyugena doctor mit bente mit si ay dala. Man wai man nak skin care moist my specialty. Ham gare. Tiki in busa harkanam regle. Lo def mujak. Am nin ya. Patricia Raina. Kiwi eye the whole range. Lighten up gold. Um, the tomatine. I mean, the list can just go on and on and on and on. Lipo lo han reglui taral jigin la chi yo yu regla nyo doh. Skin care plus nek emu yin si Gambia rek. Nyunga United States, nyungi Gambia fi. Be pare, bude yangi anywhere in Europe, mun nain la ku mail. Within three days rek, nyeti fan rek, nga jot say diw. Emu yin si lo rek, den la consult temi. Bala ni la jay diw. Then you have a free consultation for what exactly you know what you mean by the way. Then you have to say that you have any perfumes, you know, fragrances, men's shirts, accessories. We do do dresses as well. We do blouses. I mean, we do shoes. Name it, we do them. Skin Care Plus 2020 is our year of perfection. Zero tasks. Who make any real me fake? Can what if it tasks? Can what if it am problem with product? Can am? Can what if it am problem with picture? Boka am I never fake any rec? New law. The plus the fee. Hello and welcome to this special interview. Um, my name is Fatih Ture and uh, this evening with me I have Mr. Alaji Jalo. Alaji is a member of the Team SFL and he's right now joining me from the United States in Jersey City. Alaji, welcome to this special interview. Thank you for having me, Fatih. Um, first and foremost, let's talk about you, Alaji. Uh, tell us a little about yourself. Who is Alaji Jalo? Oh, my name is Alhaji Jal for the general public who I'm meeting for the first time. I am originally from Janjambore, but my family moved to Lamenko and Badala. But uh, we still have a company in Janjambore, so therefore I'll consider myself from Janjambore because almost all my brothers were born there. I went to Methodist Primary School, then from there I went to Amitage. From Amitage High School, I went to Gambia High School. And then I came to the United States where I went to Hunter College. I studied political science and economics. And after that, I opened my own business in the Bronx. So basically, I am a business owner. I have a restaurant. And I also do consulting, you know, business consulting. I, talk to people who are having problems with their businesses. I help them out how to organize, how to market, and also how to train their staff. And in addition to that, I'm also very um, involved in our community. 
um, part of the mosque. And also we had some known for profit organizations in New York here because when I first came here, we were having problems when new arrivals were finding it difficult to get jobs. And uh, we get together and form organizations so that we can help them get jobs. And also if somebody is get sick, somebody is sick, then the community can come together and assist the individuals. And uh, in most dear circumstances, you know, when there is a diseased person here, sometimes sending that person back to the Gambia was a problem. So it was the need for the Gambian community to come together and uh, contribute money to make sure that, you know, you know, as Africans, we, we honored our dead bodies. So we don't want to dispose them here in America. So we send them back in for burial. And these were some of the things that I've been involved in New York for the past couple of years. And uh, being a student of political science, I've always been involved, not at the national level, but um, at the local level, but the conditions that are taking place in, in the Gambia, but Africa as a whole, you know, I just have the feeling that Africa can do better and we have the resources and we are the cradle of human civilization. And um, the fact that we are still at the bottom of society borders me a lot. So I've always been interested in about what can we do as a continent to provide for our people? Because here in the West, what normally happens is, you know, most of the information about Africa is always negative. So, um, and it bothers me because I believe that we have one of the most intelligent people in the world. And I'm talking to one of them right now. And so, um, in a nutshell, that is who I am. And thank you. Something very interesting, you are a political science, you studied political science, but now in business. How would you describe the Gambian political situation right now? Uh, right now, what I am seeing is, what I saw, what I'm seeing right now is something that I actually think is very good because people are really energized. And in a democracy, if, when the population uh, distanced themselves from their own government, there is always a disconnect. And that disconnect constrain accountability. Part of the political process, it's, it's healthy for democracy. And uh, I do talk to people here, especially in America um, who most of them are not even interested about their government. I do tell them that for democracy to thrive, people have to really participate. So what is going on in the Gambia is very good. Competition is good. I think we call that the, the battleground of ideas. And then ultimately the best ideas will win, I believe, if it is free and fair. You are part of Team SFL. Now tell us why did you endorse SFL as a candidate? We have we had over 20 something candidates in the country. Um, after elimination, we now have six candidates. Why SFL? Uh, for a number of reasons. Um, actually, I came to follow uh, to follow him um, during the TRRC, like most Gambians, and um, and I was looking for a number of things. I wanted to understand um, the, the individual who is running our country. How are they committed to the rule of law? Um, do they actually believe that um, the constitution is supreme? Um, do they believe in checks and balances? Do they believe in like an imperial president, somebody who could do whatever? And uh, based on his questions and then his interpretation of the constitution. And especially when he was talking to ministers, high ranking officials in the military or some minister of, minister of justice. And uh, he let them understand that the president is not above the law. And that in a democracy, 
nobody is above the law and then the rule of law should really prevail. And I actually believe in that too much because the reason why the West is functioning the way it is, the president is not above the law. And therefore, I want to have a president in the Gambia, not only in the Gambia, but also to send an example in Africa that our heads of states, we have a social contract with them. That means they are elected and they are answerable to the people. And if there is a disconnect there, then they could do whatever. And I think the past 22 years is what we have seen. We had a head of state who believed, who called the country, the Kabimakomo, this is my country, and uh, there is no respect for the rule of law. He can fire Georgians, he can do whatever he wants. And then that is not healthy. And I believe that President SFR will be somebody who will respect the constitution. And once you respect the constitution and uh, the country will function well, because there isn't, there isn't for this dysfunctionality in our country, people are not held accountable. Petty criminals are sent to jail while people are embezzling millions of dollars, impoverishing the masses, and they are running free. And in fact, we celebrate them. You know, we call them like, you know, these people are successful. And there are a number of examples in the country that everybody knows that these people are living above their income. And nobody say anything. No sure. one. A lot of people will say, though, Essa, um, yes, has a fine CV, um, you know, did very well on the TRC. Some still have issues with the TRC issue. We'll come to that. But um, what professional, what, what, uh, when it comes to governance, when it comes to the presidency, um, do you think somebody who is so new in politics, uh, he's never served in any capacity apart from when he was um, just newly, um, uh, when he was appointed at the Ministry of Justice, as was some years back, he has no administrative capacity. Yes, he worked in international organizations. Would you say that it's just too early to have a president SFR? I mean, it's actually not because we have seen um, he has been not in the Gambia. You might say that you know he has not hold um, a senior position in the government, but um, he has been working with the international community, helping fix countries. I mean, you know, he was consulting in so many governments in Eastern Europe who were having problems after the collapse of communism and therefore they needed to um, establish functioning democracies and Istima also was one of them when you know the international community when there was the problem with Indonesia and the international community had to go there and help them set up a new country and many Gambians actually participated with that and he was also very instrumental in stabilizing that country as a whole and I think Gambia is not a big country that would be a challenge to him, given his wealth of experience. Uh, I think he have the apparatus of government that will actually enable him to implement some of his policies. Because the major issue in our country is the lack of commitment to good governance. And if the if you have that central element right and the rest of the government will function actually very well but if the leader is not actually committed to the rule of law and ultimately that's where the problem lies so i think he understands how government functions he understands the role of government and then he had very good policies that i think he will be able to implement so you don't need to actually spend years in government in order to be able to run a country. And we have an example. For example, I always compared him to Barack Obama in the United States. And to when he was running for president, the argument against him was he was even less than, you know, he spent almost about only two years in the Senate. Senate yeah. 
they were saying that he needs to stay for a long time. You know, he didn't have a lot of experience. They entrusted the government to him. And then he was facing one of the greatest recessions in 2008. He turned the country around, he cut down on employment rate. By the time he left the country, the country was definitely on a sound footing. And that is what is continuing up to now. Donald Trump came with all what happened, but he could not wreck the economy. So I think we need, sometimes in Africa, we just need to give, we have to be willing to try smart, intelligent people who have a track record of success to make sure that they can run our countries. And I believe ESA is one of the people who could do that. I mean, um, so about a couple of weeks ago, I saw the team, um, the, the ESA, the, the, the intellectual K that, that surrounds ESA far, the team of support he has. And when you look at that, you're only thinking, um, wow, what, what a team. Now, let's talk about the team that surrounds ESA. What is the capacity of ESA's team? Why do you think we should entrust this country to ESA and that team? And, you know, it's, you, it's not easy, for example, to get into people's head and see what they're thinking. Um, as human beings, the only way we can determine, you know, is by studying behavior. And you know, that is a whole long intellectual argument on that. I will not get into that. But um, you can look at the people surrounding him. You know, these are all people with a track record of success. Whether our chairman Alagi Sanyong, you know, vice president of a very successful corporation, or Hadijalo, Dr. Mbai, Dr. Sanya, and Musa Ajalo, and a bunch of them, you know. Lamin Ture and others, and in the Gambia, James Brown, Mohammed Gillett. These are all successful people that you can look at their resumes, you can look at their track record. You know, right now in this day and age, there's nothing to hide, and uh, you can see what they have accomplished in their lives. These are people of integrity that I believe that they are not only highly educated with masters on masters degrees on average. Some of them are PhDs in multiple bachelor's degrees. And uh, I think our country needs that because I haven't seen any country in the world that have succeeded with people who are not educated or people who are just mediocre. And companies don't do that. I mean, you know, go to the best companies in the world. They have the best people to run, run their companies. And countries as well too, if you want to develop as countries, we really have to hire people who are highly qualified, people who have a track record of success in their individual lives, in their professional lives, and then we entrust the country to them. Because generally human beings don't change overnight, you know. And you know, that's how we are as human beings. And and that's the reason why when we started this campaign, I think we published the name of all these people. And yeah. you can go and look at them, you know, find out who these people are, what they are doing, and uh, be rest assured that if we are entrusted to run the Gambia, we will definitely have a developed country in a certain period of time. Because the major problem that we have is not that we don't have the human and material resources, I believe that we have one of the most brilliant people on this planet. And I've met them all over the world and some of the people in the team and even some of the people in the other political parties. And yeah. I believe that we should be able to have a developed country if you all work together as a country. And I think uh, Team ESA will be able to do that for the Gambian people. Now let's talk about the program the Team SFL program, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, you launched your manifesto. What is this team's priority area? If elected in December 4th, what is the most, what is the first task that this um, team will deal will deal with? What is the first task? And first of all is this, um, what, we have, what we have looked at is a whole number of issues. 
we look at the actual governance, uh, the structure of the government and the civil service. You know, that's where you have to start. First of all, you have to really put competent people. And there's something in government where they're called putting square pegs in round holes. That's always a problem. You know, you have to really hire people. People should be hired based on merit. You know, you know, nepotism and all these other stuff should be put aside. And then we look at the individual. You know, and make sure that we have that right first. And therefore, we look at the economy. You know, how is our economy being run? And most of the problem that the reason why many of we having a lot of issues with resources is because there is rampant corruption in the Gambia. And uh, the government is not collecting revenue enough. And that is the reason why we are unable to build good roads, we are unable to build hospitals and take care of our people. And once you close all those loopholes, we will have enough money within the country itself to make sure that we will take care of our own people. Healthcare is also an issue. And we all know that, you know, our hospitals, they are understaffed under resource, poorly managed, and the infrastructure is dilapidated, and even gloves, which are even small businesses in America here yeah, could even make gloves and sell gloves. But you know, major hospital like the Gabby we came up. And the reason is not that we don't have the money to do that. We have seen people driving expensive vehicles that could really fund hospitals. We have seen the current government buying vehicles while the hospitals don't have that. Law enforcement is also another thing. Security. If you, for, for there to be any meaningful development, people have to have a sense of security so that they can open businesses, so that they can come. Foreigners or Gambians are sitting on millions, if not billions of dollars that they can pour into our economy, create jobs, do a whole lot of things. The reason why that money is not reaching the Gambia right now, people think that if they invest their money, it's difficult to invest. Gambia being at the bottom of countries to do business, I think second to last. And why would you come to the Gambia and invest? Some of you are doing very well there, but, but I'm sure there are a lot of challenges. There are challenges, you know, a lot of red tape, whatever you want. I have friends, business owners here in New York, Gambians, who, who want to extend their operations in the Gambia. But the bribery, the corruption is killing them. Um, I have one of them, you know, he was trying to open up a slaughterhouse in the Gambia. But he could not get the permits. You know, he has to do everything possible. Then ultimately he has to bribe top ranking officials. And, and that person could have been able to employ so many Gambia. And that's the reason why we have all this high unemployment rates. And also the youths, the educational system. But before we go to that, you mentioned something that is very important. The Gambia is being rated as the one, the worst, some, one of the worst countries to do business in here, uh, according to Forbes report. Um, a, a pre, SFR presidency, how are you going to improve that? Because that is really serious. If we don't have a, a vibrant private sector, our economy will be stagnant. Jobs will not be, you know, we will not have jobs for the young people. But how would an SFR presidency tackle that situation? Thank you very much, um, Fatu. You see, the, the economy is, running a vibrant economy is very important because we tell that, you know, you will not be able to take care of your citizens and then unemployment also will continue to um, skyrocket. And the reason why we have a lot of corruption in the Gambia is because it's enforcement is really very low. I mean, we need to have, SFR government will have an anti-corruption commission. And that will be entrusted with the responsibility of making sure that 
there would be no corruption in the country. I'm sure people will attempt to do that, but it will be at your own detriment. Because first of all, and the reason, and you also have to look at why is, why is it the issue? Um, because if you just keep on um, torturing the symptoms without looking at the root causes, you will find it difficult. And many of the people in the country, it's not that they are dishonest or they want to do that, but they want to make a living. They have family. So therefore, you have to make sure that you pay them a livable wage so that they will not be tempted. And not only that, once you have that, then there will be an enforcement mechanism whereby people will not be willing to take a risk to be corrupt if they know that they are well paid and then if they are caught, they will be fired. There has to be consequences. So they have to be both the, the carrot and the stick policy. You really have to make sure that people are well paid. You incentivize them. And then you also train them. Because the reason why many of these people are taking bribes, they think they are helping themselves. But in the long run, they are ruining our economy. They are ruining the future of our kids. Because if you don't have a functioning government, Ultimately, we have all these young people, they are unemployed, they are in the street, and some of them are leaving, and we all know the plight of them. A lot of them are perishing in the Mediterranean Ocean, and some of them are stuck in asylum camps in Italy without jobs, without education. And these are the future of our country. So SFL government will make sure that, you know, there's a whole range of things to do. The salaries will definitely be increased. And then enforcement mechanism, but also there will be an, an e-economy. Because the reason why people are stealing a lot of this money is because there's no control. Here in America, you don't send money. You write checks, or you could do it electronically. So that the ability of our government to collect revenue will be increased tremendously. And then, there will not be the opportunity for people to steal because there will be no paper money. And once you do that, it's easy to track you know, the payments. And then we will also sensitize the public that if you need a birth certificate, if you need a passport, there are processes you know, that everybody is aware of them. And then you don't have to pay anybody for that. For heaven's sake, why do you have to pay somebody to get an ID card? Why do you have to bribe anybody to do that? Mm -hmm. And then also our, our law enforcement officers. For example, <clears throat> in New York here, you know, we have almost more cars than almost more cities in the world. And uh, the police go around and give tickets, you know, for violation. That tickets alone brings a lot of revenue. But it will not cross your mind to take a penny or to give it to a police officer because they're writing a ticket. It will not. But the reason why police officers will do that here is because they're-, they're They they're, are not well paid. Yeah. So that's why we have to make sure they are well paid and then, then we have to educate them. But how, but then it brings the cow question, how are we able to raise that revenue? You know, our only source of revenue here is the, the revenue collectors. They, 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 they collect about 13 billion in a year. That is a fraction of our, our national budget. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna have to continue to, to, to take grants, to take loans. Our debt ceiling is, is, is crazy right now. How is all of this, um, how are we able to do all of this if this is our situation right now? How are we going to maximize our revenue to be able to fund our programs ourselves? Um, for a number of reasons. You see, government, if you look at, you know, the entirety of government, sometimes it's, it looks like a business. Uh, you collect money and then you invest it. And then at the end of the day, you make profit. And then you reinvest that money back into the resources. The reason why we're having a lot of these problems is because of the wastage. You know, the revenue is not actually being collected. If you look at the amount of revenue that is needs to be collected in the Gambia. I don't think we have even collected a quarter of that money. And if all that money is collected, the country will have will, will, will have enormous amount of resources to, to invest in the economy. We could take that money and invest in agriculture so that we can start exporting. We can 
we, 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 we can also invest it in education so that our, our, our citizens will be more productive. We can train them. And without that, you will not have the money. And then the idea that we have to continue to be corrupt, we have to leave, continue doing it. We can study countries that, that actually change their trajectory. Uh, Singapore is one of them. And, um, and they also had independence around the same time that our country had. But the difference between Singapore and the country is like they are forced to understand the situations. And then the first thing they, they started doing was to make sure that they they they, they, they streamlined the government and cut, you know, dealt with the mafia that were in the country then, who were controlling all businesses. You have to bribe, you have to pay. And ultimately, the government were able to invest in their own people. And they started building public housing for their citizens. And in the beginning, when they started building public housing, people were urinating in the elevators. Elevators here, they, I think they call them lifter in the Gambia. And they put a mechanism whereby if you if you if you do that, the elevator will stop, they will come and arrest you. So there has to be accountability in a country. When there is no accountability, people do whatever they want. And that is what is happening in Africa. Um, Gambia in particular, in, you know, people do things, you know, they steal money and uh, the governments are not functioning. And we cannot have the resources that we need if that money is not collected. Believe me, the reason why here their cities, their municipalities function well, you know, they're constantly paving their roads is because of the amount of revenue they collect. If all that money were like, if the police officers were collecting the money and they're doing all this kind of stuff putting it in their own pockets, believe me, the city of New York will not be able to run their trains 24 hours, buses 24 hours. You know, if businesses were not paying the, the amount of taxes that we're supposed to pay, it will not happen. But here, for example, uh, my brother travels all the time. You know, he comes to the Gambia often. Uh, he said, even, in, even at our airport, for example, you know, at the parking lot, people are supposed to pay money. Yeah. But the young people there at the parking lot, the money is not even reaching the government. So even at the airport alone, the airport is losing like thousands of dollars on a daily basis because what people do, they come, he, he, he just remove the gate and they give him $10 and put it in his pocket. And these are like thousands of these occurring on a daily basis. I've seen that growing up in Janjambore in Makati. Uh, people who collect, you know, duty in the market or, you know, at the ferry services or anywhere you see. And, you know, it's like the government is losing thousands and thousands on a daily basis at our air, uh, at, our, at our port authority, the same thing too. At the port, people bring vehicles or they bring a whole kind of stuff. And what they will do is they will just fill a form and say they bring this so and so and so and so. And, uh, you know, they bring their stuff in. So we lose money, and then money go into people's hands. Just look at the people who walk at our port authorities and stuff like that. And look at the amount of money that they have. Pay them well, you know, because they're generating a lot of revenue for the country, but make sure that that money is collected and it will go into our national coffers. We can use that money to invest in in the health sector, we invest in education, train our people, develop them so that we can build our own country. We have our military, for example, the, our, our soldiers are well trained. Many of them could have been trained how to build roads and bridges. When you want to build a road, what do we do? We get a company from Senegal or somewhere else. We have young and vibrant Gambians that we can train, we can rebuild our own country. Alagi Sane is one of those engineers too. <laughs> I mean, all, it won't even take two or a, year or a year or two years to train some of these people and bring them back to the Gambia. We can build highways from Banjo to Pasi, big roads, in fact, with flyovers built by Gambia. But look at this OIC and all the other road projects. 
is going to be entrusted with international organizations. The only thing we will have is like we'll have the roads, but all the revenue will go out. Yeah. But yeah. If our citizens are trained, that money will stay in our own country. And it will employ thousands of Gambians. So this, the young people that we are catching that they are lazy, believe me, you, you, you will call our kids lazy. But the day that a young person step in America here, he will be feeding hundreds of people in Uganda. Yeah. And yeah. One individual. Yeah. The only difference is he was in the Gambia and now he's in the United States. Yeah. So that means we just have bad systems. If we have the right conducive atmosphere, our people are very, very productive. And I believe in the Gambian people will deliver. But there, you, you talked about two different areas here, the health sector and security, very key. Um, right now, me and so many other Gambians feel that the security system is very fragile. Uh, a lot of um, theft around the country. The security service uh, reform, you ask me, I say has failed uh, because we were supposed to have our security handed over to the Gambian security. Up to today, we have economic here. In fact, um, after the election, they're thinking of having ECOMIC to come in as a, gang, have a, uh, as a police unit in the country, which a lot of these politicians are against. But what would an Elijah Sanyang government do to enhance our SFL government? SFL government. Sorry about that. SFL okay. government to enhance our local uh, or national security. Um, Gambians are worried. You go to bed at night, you, you, you're scared who's going to break in. This has never been our situation. How is SFL going to fix that for the ordinary Gambia? Okay, very good. Um, with our security down in our development, and I'll just use a quick example about what was going on, happening here in, in New York. Uh, in the 80s and the early 90s, um, there was weak mayors that were running in New York City. And uh, there was high crime rates in New York. And there were like people where businesses were leaving and uh, people were constantly being stabbed. And there was a sense of insecurity, just, just like the situation that we have in the Gambia. Then all of a sudden we have a mayor, the mayor was elected and uh, he put a lot of police in the street and then law enforcement and all this, and prosecuting criminal, going after mafia and all the other stuff. And ultimately, the crime rate plummeted. And uh, for a long period of time, until last year when the pandemic hit, New York City was the safest place, city in America. And the Gambia also, what an SFL government is going to do is to empower the law, the law enforcement officers. Right now, the police, most of the police stations, they use taxi in order to make a noise. I have a family member who is a police somewhere in Brickham, I think, and he was using his vehicle to go and arrest, effect an arrest, and uh, he will make sure that the police get the resources that they need. Instead of buying pickup vehicles and giving it to political Operators like what the government is doing right now will make sure that every police station is well staffed, and not only that, also they are well paid because these are hard working Gambians, you know, whom you know that you know they also have children that are going to school, they have some of their children are going to the university or whatever, they have to take care of them. We have to make sure that they are well paid and they train them properly, give them the resources, and and then you, you can also identify high crime rate areas. You make sure that you have enough police patrol everywhere and a lot of undercover officers. For example, here, you know, if, if you are doing something illegal, sooner or later you will see yourself in handcuffs because the individual who was sitting right in front of you, dressed in mufti, it, it's, it's an undercover officer. So you really have to have a lot of undercover officers but you also have to look at the root cause of the problem. The problem why we have high crime rates is it's also high unemployment. When there are economic hardships, 
there is always bound to be an increase in crime rates. It happens in America all the time. If there is a recession, you know, crime rates are high, and that's the reason why the government will pump more money into the economy and welfare so that people will have jobs. And Gambia, people are, you know, people are really suffering, to be honest. You know, you know families without jobs and those who are in government are not properly paid. And they have their children at home. They have to feed themselves. You have all these teenagers sitting around. They have nothing to do. They want to dress properly. They, you know, they want to look cool. And the only way they can do it sometimes, they don't have family members in a broad who is poor sending them money. And they have to do something else to survive. So the survival instinct is pushing a lot of these people into crimes. And we have to make sure that we deal with that. And, and I believe that understanding, having what they call a holistic approach to the whole thing and will enable you to have good policies that will deal with that. But you really have to under, uh, know the underlying the root cause of the problem first. And once you know that, and then you will use law enforcement. Because if you only if you only put police in the street, you might put a lot of people in jail. Yeah. yeah. But if you don't address the economic situation, if you don't fix our economy, you will find it very difficult to make sure that crime rates are really low. And and that is an issue that the, the, the government have to really deal with. If you don't do that, it's just uh, wasting our own time, believe me. Now, let's talk about the health sector. Um, I think our biggest concern in this country is uh, maternal mortality. Yes. Uh, it's been something that has been really, really on the high rate right now in the country. Um, you go to hospitals, um, not adequate uh, gloves, hair gloves, not had adequate beds, and the government will tell you, um, they will always dispute these stories. But these are the facts, these are the stories that comes from our hospitals. Even nurses coming out and making videos about the current situation in our hospitals. What will SFR do to improve the health sector? And we're not just, you know, last time I had him on the show, we talked about his plan. But for me, it's more about the how, because the ordinary Gambian, he talked about a, um, a health secure scheme where mm -hmm. people can have health insurance. But yeah. that's what President Barrow just introduced now at the parliament. Um, for me, it's how effective. How can the ordinary Gambian in Janjambure pay for a health scheme? The first thing they were thinking about how to put food on the table, because Gambia is one of the poorest countries in the, in, in, in the world. How is SFR going to address that to make sure every single Gambian, poor, rich, or middle class, have access to good and quality healthcare? Okay, like everything else starts from the economy. You need to have a functioning economy, first of all. And uh, out of that functioning economy, you will be able to have money to invest in various sectors. So first of all, as I said, you know, we have to fix the economy force. We have to also make sure that uh, we increase the collection of revenue in the country and also we, we invest in our economy to make sure that it will produce jobs. And out of that, the the, the government in an on the SFR government, health will be priority. There will be investments in health. And I'm sure there are people who will not be able to afford that. The government will be able to subsidize that to make sure that the health sector is given the resources that it needs. You know, there is enough medicine in the hospital, there are doctors and to treat patients, and then there are well-trained individuals at all levels to make sure that people are taken care of. And also not only in medicine, but also what they call preventive health. Uh, we have to educate our population, you know, like, you know, the major cause of many of these problems right now in the Gambia is diabetes, hypertension. And we have to look at our diets so that, you know, there is a cultural thing in the Gambia, for example, when you are fat, you know, we, we, we look at it as something honorable you know, something good or yangi lair or yangi, you know, something like that. And we also have to understand the whole implication of 
eating fatty foods and all this other stuff. And once we do that too, I think we will cut back the rate of sicknesses uh, to a significant level. And uh, we, when, when, when we do all these things, and uh, when we also, also deal with the corruption that is taking place, because it's not that our hospitals sometimes they are not even importing a lot of medicines, but all that medicine is sold to pharmacies that have, you know, whatever you cannot get in the hospital, you can go to a private pharmacy, you can get it there. And you ask yourself, how can the government, the country, you know, run out of things, an ordinary individual with a small pharmacy could afford to import that medicine and bring it here. The fact of the matter is like people are just stealing medicine, they're stealing equipment, there is no accountability. And then you also have to put very good administrators in this hospital. Because in the West here, many of these hospitals, they are run like businesses. You know, they have CEOs and all this other stuff that look at the hospitals, you know, hire the best people, make sure that there's accountability, resources are not wasted, you know, they, they forbid the, the hospitals buying new equipment and so that we can take care of people. But if this places are not money so uh, if people could just do whatever they want there is lack of accountability in the country you know people basically could do almost whatever they want especially if you are a senior member of government a doctor whatever you can come to work anytime if you go or, you know if you're a minister you could use public vehicles and then you mentioned the maternal mortality rate but he also didn't mention something that is the infant mortality rate is still very one of the highest in the world true so and we have to look at why is it that our infants are actually dying like that mm -hmm. number one is malnutrition you know the mother poor mother doesn't have the amount of nutrition they need and then the body is born the mom doesn't have the milk, doesn't have the food to feed themselves, and then they're exposed to malaria. And that is a recipe for disaster. And sometimes it's also poor sanitary condition. You know, there was this doctor, um, the American doctor here in, of Indian origin, he was just experimenting something in India. And uh, he's, he said, you know what, people get sick most of the time in India because of bacteria. So he started just buying a bass of soap and he was giving it to poor farmers. He told them, you know, anytime that you, you use the bathroom, just wash your hands with soap, only soap. And then, and by the time they finished the experiment, they realized that they have cut sicknesses by 30%. So, and we have young moms that have kids, they have no money to buy soaps to make sure to wash their baby's clothes and they have infections and stuff. So these are all things that we can really do. It's like, first of all, we have to have the person on top who understand the problem first and enforce the laws of this country. There has to be consequences for violating the law in that country and once we have that believe me everything will fall in place but we talk with impunity that is happening in our country mm -hmm. people will just gain the system you know people don't actually care you know they still the reason why the works function the way it functions you know, uh, it's because there is accountability you can be the president of the United States, but you don't have the power to do whatever you want, you know? And then you can be the high, the richest man in America or whatever. If you violate the law, a small police office can arrest you in the street. If, 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 if you're driving or over speeding and stuff, that doesn't happen in our country. When you're powerful, you are untouchable. Nobody dare talk to you. You could do whatever you want, you know? You come and violate the law and then you buy people. So once we fix that, we'll really be able to take care of our people, make sure that they are healthy and then we can raise, you know, the, um, the life expectancy in our country is about 60 something and the low 60s, 
Yeah. And many countries are now in the 70s or in the 80s. And we ask ourselves, why is this the case? It's because we have poor healthcare sector in our country. We wait until when we are about to die and we go to the hospital. And then even going to the hospital becomes a challenge because there are no ambulances. And then there are vehicles, we go to the Congress, government department have multiples of cars, you know, political operators are all given cars, our hospitals have no ambulances. And then the funny thing is just close to the election, I've seen the president going to rallies with kids and handing them over. Ambulances. Why do you wait until election time and you started handing ambulances? And you know that this was an issue. And they're just trying to fool the Gambian people. And this has been going on in that country for the past 50 years. But let me come there. What's your assessment of President Barrow five years into office? What is your assessment of President uh, For me, um, I believe in personal integrity first. Hmm. And what was sold to the Gambian people, I believe that we the, the reason why all these political parties came together in 2016 they saw the need to change the government we all know the, the kind of dictatorship that was happening there and you know by then all was not known but like looking at the tiaras you know we know how terrible the Gambia was and uh, they all came together and then they let's change the government and let's have a transitional president or leader who will lead this transitional period, who is somebody who is not um, ambitious to hold on to power. The main focus was to make sure that there is a level playing field. You know, We look at our constitution, we look at our institution, we look at our judiciary, we look at everything that we have in our country, we fix it all, and then we come back to the drawing board again, and then everybody will run for president, and then, the country will move on. That was really a very good plan that was envisioned. But in my humble opinion, um, what happened in Africa is anytime that somebody is entrusted with power, they, they don't want to leave. The thing, we have seen that we, our first president was there for 30 years. And then Jame, we have seen when some of his colleagues wanted them to go back to barracks, he arrested them, put them in jail. So President Barrow, to the moment he took, he took over the presidency, uh, based on my observation, his primary focus was how to stay in power. So he was not invested in making sure that uh, the country comes first, and uh, that we, we, we put these institutions in place, and as a result of that, and in my own humble opinion, there are a few things that he have done which are really very good. Bridges and roads that he actually built, we have to give them credit for that. And then for maintaining the democracy that we, we, we all fought for, uh, and he actually respected that. But I, what I will also dispute is the fact that he brought democracy to Gambia, to the Gambian people. The Gambian people brought democracy by voting out Yaya Jami and voting him in. He had one vote. And then if he wanted to violate that constitution and then go back to the pre jami area, December 4th will be the opportunity for the Gambian people to tell him that this is not what we voted for. So it is not he is doing that out of his own free will. Mm. The country has actually moved away from dictatorship. Yeah. And there's a lot of literature out there about how a country changed from dictatorship uh, to a democracy. And usually that their argument is when the level of education reaches a certain point, you will find it very difficult to oppress those people. And the, the number of examples they gave was South Korea was a dictatorship. Uh, for a long period of time. But the moment, you know, they, the, they invested a lot of education and their population reached certain thresholds, you can no longer oppress the people. And personally, when once the same thing with Taiwan and a whole range of other countries. 
And then the moment I saw the Gambia University pumping a lot of people, and Jan was investing in education. So I was telling myself, um, you know, and then he was trying to oppress the people. I said, you know, you are undermining your own government because you cannot enlighten people at the same time and oppress them. So therefore, ultimately, the Gambia have reached a point whereby he, he cannot. Barrow could have done a better job in that country if he was totally focused on building the country and then looking at the economy and fixing it, fixing the corruption level. And the level of impunity in the Gambia now is just, it's beyond belief. And he is aware of it. For example, I'm sure you've heard about this, Fatu. Like when you're crossing the ferry, either going to Bara or coming from Bara, mm -hmm. you have to bribe in order to be able to go inside. Yeah. We are aware of this and it, I, it defies logic. If I tell my American friends this, they won't believe it. You have to bribe in order to get into your own ferry. And then there is a director of ferries, I'm sure there are people who are, why can't you, can't you call and leave? We, have, we have the secret service everywhere. Is the are, are the intelligence not reaching the president? It's the system. That system is run by the president. It's, you see the responsibility. They say the box ends at the president's desk. You are the system. You, when you are voted into office, you are entrusted with the responsibility to fix that country. If you cannot fix it, you should resign. But if you don't fix the problem, you don't resign, then you are the problem. I believe President Barack could have really done better. But I just feel that um, he, either he doesn't understand how government functions at a deeper level, or he actually doesn't care. Actually speaking um, right now, I just the power just went off. Can you imagine in the middle of an interview? This is what we deal with every single day. It's 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 tough. It's it, tough. But the good thing is, this is a democracy, mm -hmm. and every five years we have the opportunity mm -hmm. to change our governments. Yeah. And and this shouldn't be an emotional thing because mm -hmm. what actually happened is uh, our governments actually are not, they are very good at, they are very good at fooling the, the, the citizens. And they will wait until after election, they will, tribalize the arguments. I mean, just look at what is coming out of the government right now. I mean, the accusation that they are leveling against political parties, especially the UDP party. And it's totally not fair. I believe that, I believe in fairness, you know. Let us compete on the agenda, on our manifestos and our priorities, but let us have respect for each other and then let's have integrity in our system and and we all call ourselves believers and the majority of the governments are muslims and then we all know what our last thing about truth telling you know about justice and if you are a head of state i mean you have to make sure that anything that you are seeing has to be factually correct and you don't want to win the presidency and lost your soul. And, you know, history is going to Georgia. Even if you're going to be a one-time president, make sure that you end that time honorably by being, you know, by being honest, by telling the people the reality. You know, don't accuse somebody of something that you know that between you and your God is not really true. At the end of the day, also we, we are human beings. You know. I, I just believe that we have to have respect for each other. I mean, the tone of the president regarding, you know, the opposition leaders, especially. Um, and, and just two days ago, the president made a very serious um, um, 
serious, made some, said something really serious against the Gambian diaspora, especially the diasporans that are against him. Uh, he said, it's, 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 it's interesting that President Barrow, who was funded by the diaspora, today is saying that those diaspora that are criticizing him, they don't even have a kitchen, a chicken house in the Gambia. They, don't, they are jobless in the diaspora. They don't wish the Gambia well. This is coming from a sitting president, our president. And how does that make you feel as a diaspora, as somebody who doesn't believe in the president's agenda? I, have, I believe we can all, we are all Gambians and we all believe in, um, in one way or the other that we believe we're doing the best for the country. But we also have a right to support or against the president's policy or even against his political ambitions because we don't believe in what his agenda is. But does that warrant the president to say stuff like that to the Gambian diaspora, especially, um, especially those who helped to elect him to become president of the republic? Uh, I will just go back to uh, when you ask me, for instance, how do I assess Barrow's government? For me, the problem that I have with him is integrity. You know, you promise and then you renegade from that promise. And and if you look at if you look at the trajectory of his government, you will see that lack of integrity in in, in all that he said and. Um, and he does, for example, uh, anything, most African presidents, you know, it's really sad to say that they will do whatever to stay in power. You know, the truth doesn't matter, reality doesn't matter. And for him, anything that helps him stay in power is actually good. For example, um, when the APRC joined him, you know, he was in Menson in Germany. It was okay for Germany or whatever. He went to Canada and he was supporting. And the only time, and then the TRRC, and then we, we are lucky that Germany actually spoke against him. If not, the TRRC report would have never seen daylight under his leadership. And the only reason why they're able to bring their report right now and it's because Jeremy is speaking against him. So for Barrow, for me, I just look at him, I compare him to Conde and to all the other African leaders that I've studied in Africa. And, and that's the reason why we really have to change our government. We need people like SFR, people with integrity, and to run our countries that we could hold accountable. Because, and other than that, we are just going to continue on this part of mediocrity. You know, there are no standards, anything stands. You can stay whatever on the state, even though you are a president of the country. You can brag that, you know, you tear gas, you know, and then you can brag in your rallies that you would destroy a political party and then as a head of state. Oh, and that is, those things are uncalled for. You have to respect the constitution, you know, you know, you sure that sworn to the constitution that you will uh, that you will protect the rights and liberties of your own citizens. You shouldn't because you wanted to hold on to power. You shouldn't go around and uh, make pronouncements. I've heard him encouraging commissioners and governors to come and join him and campaign for him, and that is just. That is in violation of our constitution. And unless and until we start holding our leaders accountable, nothing is going to work in Africa. And going back to accusing the diaspora of being irresponsible or whatever, um, you know, this so is not about what I'm doing, but I will just give you just a bit of an example, of some of the things that people from the diaspora are doing. For the past couple of years, you know, we set up an organization in the Gambia where we go and get people with mental health, people who are in the streets for like years. We cure them, we take them to, you know, we started with Tanka Tanka, now we do, we're dealing with Dr. John, who's a very famous psychiatrist in the Gambia. 
we provide all the medicine, all the transportation. We stabilize those people, we give them medicine. And some of them are now cured. You know, they are back helping their families. And then we are expanding this. As we speak right now, just two days ago, one of our patients came and get the medicines. And, uh, and that is just at that level. I also support students who are at the Gambia University that are not even related to me. You know, GTTI, family members. On average, on average, I spend about $500 a week to the Gambia. Multiply that by $50, that will give you the amount. And, not all, and, and, and these are just few of the stuff that we are doing. And, and in 2016, we all contributed, including myself. We sent it to the opposition to make sure that we defeated our job. Because without resources, there was no way that he would have been able to sit where he was at. But the moment he took over power, when we speak against him, we say we have no heart. Actually, I have resources in the Gambia. Our family have, my brother and I are doing very well. You know, we have cattle, you know, we have vehicles, we have businesses in the Gambia. And we haven't taken a single penny from the Gambia government. I never have any scholarship from the Gambia government. I came here, struggled by myself, and I went to college. I was working in a restaurant, paying for my school fees. I graduated and opened my own business. And I'm supporting my country. So, and then many of the people in the diaspora, we have one of our members every year in the Gambia, he will dig two boreholes. And he doesn't even want thank you from the people. And we have orders, they have known for profit. We have also a member of our organization who is building um, renewable. Um, fuel for uh, for the local communities, so that people will be able to make their own gas, make their own charcoals without cutting our trees. Deforestation is a problem, and then we have one of the people from our strategy group, from the SFR group. They're building a clinic in Kodang, and almost everybody that we have in our strategy group are doing something have a known for profit or is associated with something very positive in our country, in addition to helping our family members. And uh, major, majority, I mean, if you look at our GDP, I think the amount of money that we send in, you know, it's just, I think more than half of our GDP is coming from us in the diaspora. Yes, yes, and so if we don't support you, 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 you can, you know, I mean, you sit in, I mean, call us names. I mean, it's okay to agree, and also to, we we need to agree and disagree. I mean, it's fine. It, uh, it it's okay to do that in a democracy. And but we shouldn't. What 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 I want us to take away from this is, and I think that's what Asa preaches all the time. Is um, that's why one day in one of his rally, he was making a speech, and then the interpreter said. I've seen all that money. Yes, I say, no, 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 I didn't say that. He said, I respect my president. I am not going to make any pronouncement. I'm not going to be disrespectful to anybody. And I think we should do that. We should look at policies. Like, what is your plan on healthcare? What's my plan? We compare it. We sell it to the Gambian people. We convince them for us. But we shouldn't say anything just to get elected, even if the information is not true. When we do that, we destroy our democracy, we destroy our country. And then, and then we socialize the younger generation in believing that it's okay to say things that are not true. And that is not a recipe uh, for success. Uh, let us be people of integrity, you know, respect the rule of law and uh, understand that this country that we have, it could be fixed. It has the right mindset, it has the good people. And I applaud the people in the media, especially yourself. And uh, when I was thinking about this interview, uh, something came to my mind. I said, I will say it here. I think you are the Oprah Winfrey of the Gambia. Oh, thank you. Thank, yes. you. And, thank you. And I think your media will definitely grow and blossom because you know you have integrity. I mean, you know, 
people who look at all the networks and they read them and, and people I've seen, including myself, said very positive things about you, that you are impartial. And the media is supposed to be like that. You know, you talk to all the political parties and then whosoever wants to come to your, you know, to your platform, to give them the opportunity to communicate with the Gambian people. And which is, which is, and, and for democracy to function, you see, the institutions of government, the media, and, and then, and then the, the general public, all these things are really very important. And we cannot have one element itself. And some, some people even believe that the media is the child rail of government. Yeah. You know, when you have the legislature, the judiciary and the executive, they believe that the media is the fourth you know, element of a democratic country. So therefore, I think we have to continue to communicate with our citizens uh, so that they can participate fully, so that we will hold our leaders accountable. And the corruption have to stop, the mismanagement of public funds have to stop. We have to invest in our country so that we can have the amount of future that we want. If we don't do that, things are not going to change magically. The countries where we all like the West, where some of us are living now, you know, the reason why we are coming here, the reason why there are jobs, the reason why they, it's because their institutions function. There is the rule of law. You can do whatever you want, and 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 and, and, and continue to be free. You break the law, you will pay a price. You know, senior officers can just embezzle government money and all that thing that they, that will happen. You can do it at your own risk. Every day, uh, a couple of years ago, one early morning, they arrested, the FBI in the United States arrested about half of the city council of Jersey City because they were involved in corruption and deals and all this stuff. Early dawn in the morning, around half of them were all handcuffed and sent to jail. And we see that here all the time, senators, members. Yeah. That is unheard of in the Gambia. And that's the reason why ministers are wasting resources. And people are just doing whatever they want. Because there is no accountability. During the days of Yaya Jami, you know, he can arrest you, and but he was corrupt, <laughs> and he was doing whatever he wants. But now, so, but, 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 of that. people say during Jami's time, corruption was just one person. But now, it's... everybody is doing it because there's no accountability. People are not afraid of the government, so. So finally, finally, I know we're running out of time. What's your message to Gambians? And also, um, in six days, we go to the polls. Are you optimistic we're going to have a president as of well? I, I believe that I, we would win this election. Because mm. the way I look at things is the majority of the people in the country are youths. Mm. And they're clamoring for change because they have no future in the country. The only future is during through the bad way or the few mm. ones who are lucky to have family members to bring them to America or to Europe. And and also traveling, leaving the country is not a good way of it's not the best way to fix a country. Mm -hmm. Even though some of us are here, we're sending money there, but I believe that the best way is to develop our citizens, give them good education, so that we can manufacture the things that we need in our own country and sell it to the outside world, build our own houses, build our own roads. And not only that also, um, I know I didn't mention it, but for example, um, these multinational corporations, Mm -hmm. They have call centers in India. Yeah. And then our Gambian kids, anytime that I speak to them, 
I'm always embarrassed because they speak better English than I. I mean, I really have to watch my grammar, especially the kids that are in the university. I said, mm -hmm. wow, I don't know, because I've been here for a while and I lost a lot of these grammar rules and stuff. And those kids could be employed by Amazon, by the Bank of America to pick up poor phone call. We could set up those centers in the Gambia and that could really employ thousands of audience that we have the right process. And that money that they are paid, that money is going to stay and stimulate our economy. So I believe the youths, the people have a big opportunity on the SFR government and especially the women as well. And we haven't mentioned women that much in this interview, but yes, I visited a lot of the women's centers either at Jahali Pachar and then at Tanjin, the fish markets money will really be allocated to these important sectors of our economy in youth development, women empowerment. And he even promised that, you know, how his government is going to be women. And then ultimately we'll encourage even the parliament itself. We just have to work out mechanisms because women are almost now the majority in the country. Yeah. And we have to make sure that they are represented because, you know, they are smart and hard work and, and we have to make sure that there is a level playing field in the Gambia. You know, no gender discrimination. We know that we all know that there is always gender bias in our country and most of it is rooted in misunderstanding what the Islamic interpretation is because Islam is saying that one sex is better than the other. But Islam is saying that everybody has a responsibility, a role to play. Mm -hmm. And we have to make sure that that interpretation is explained to the people and so that we will have a country that we are all proud of. But my message to the Gambian people is let's vote for ASFR because I believe that he is the best candidate that and he is one of, he is the most qualified candidate to run our country. And uh, he is bold, educated, and is a person with integrity. Given the youth population that we have in our country, we need a president who actually can connect to them at that level and then understand how the international, both the national and also the international community functions. This is a guy who is consulting with fixing other countries. And I think it, now it's time that he has to come back and also help us develop our country. If given the opportunity to serve, he will serve with integrity and he will cut down corruption. He will invest in education and in health. And then there will also be, um, he will empower our law enforcement officers instead of allowing foreigners to come and run our security. I think he had faith in our law enforcement and he will empower them. And not only that, he will have a professional army that will participate in the construction of the country. And these are all plans that he has for the country. And now is the opportunity for you, the Gambian people, uh, to deliver on your end. Because at the end of the day, we'll make the argument, but you have to vote for him. Every four years, we have the opportunity to change our government peacefully. And uh, we have to maintain that for democracy to work. If we do not change the government, what ends up happening is this dysfunctionality will continue to occur. And then given the, um, the high you know, growth of our population, and then the high unemployment rates, ultimately that's what creates these problems that we see in other countries. So in order to, for that to happen, we have to understand the seriousness of the problem, and then we address it now. It is not only smarter, but it's also cheaper. So I believe we can do this as a country, and then 
thank you for the support so far and I believe that on January 4th you will definitely vote for Asa Fala and Ms. Hobea Group. Thank you very much, Elaji. Interesting, interesting. I hope we will be able to get you before election, just a day or so before election, to look at the landscape again and see where your campaign is, uh, what are the chances, um, how optimistic you are. Uh, it will be interesting, but definitely we appreciate having you on the platform. It's, it's, it's just interesting to hear some of the things that the SFR team will be delivering if ESA is elected uh, on December 4th. Thank you very much for coming and we do appreciate having you on the platform. Thank you for having me and I really appreciate the time and the opportunity to speak to the Gambian people and uh, I will be more than glad to be back and speak to my fellow compatriots again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aladi. See you soon. See you. Bye. And that was Alaji Jalo, um, a member of Team SFR. We'll definitely have him back again. It was a very interesting conversation, and we hope you all enjoy the show. Uh, join us another time. It's six days to election. Um, we will be having a lot of political players to talk to about the state of their campaign and also the state of the race right now. Until we come again, good night to you all. Bye-bye. See you. Perfect skin. Skin care, rolling so problems with skin, you can not have products Do Paris, do Italy, do USA, ah? Do Pimekaniza, Bolle, Nintina, Sweden. Funnekalin in the products, put it in the new rig, new lay jama, ah? Natural beauty, that melanin dripping, we do have stuff for you as well. And when you see skincare products like Nunchichu, Vitamin, ah, Funnekalin, you are in fact, sir. Last commercial being the phone, woman in one of the new doctor, a cover, nine a great rag neck. Wow, we do have bundles as well. Hair. Wow, more than the two kids, Amit. Go on that classic suitcase. You the new Dr. Ice Samsonite. Do they in the any brown of suitcases though other than Samsonite? Come lima dey wahrek. Bo ege airport. Dere Samsonite. Dafa amnu la hole. Wow. Ngen dala nak. Wow. Um, skin. Chimomli nyu gena hamie nak skin care products. Chimomli nyu gena hamie nyu gena Dr. Amit bente Amit si aydala. Man, why man like skin care moist my specialty? I'm gonna take in with a hard canum regle, Lord of Mujak. I mean, um, Patricia Reiner, Kiwi Eye, the whole range, Lighten Up Gold, um, Tomatine. I mean, the list can just go on and on and on and on. Lipolo and regular taral jigilla, Kiyo regla yodo. Skin care plus neck, Emuins the Gambia, Nunga United States, Nungi Gambia fee, the party, Buday Yangi, anywhere in Europe. Within three days, you can get a job. You can get a consult. You can get a free consultation for exactly what you can do. You can get a perfume, you know, fragrances, men's shirts, um, accessories. We do do dresses as well. We do blouses. I mean, we do shoes. Name it, we do them. Skin Care Plus 2020 is our year of perfection. Zero tasks. Who make any real me fit? Can what are perfect tasks? Can what are fit? problem with canam. Can what are fit? problem with picture. Book a man who fake and erect new law. Get plus the fee.